So if you're here and you don't have children, does that mean you get an express pass direct to lunch? You don't have to stay? Lock the doors. No one leaves. Because there are other children in your life that need your prayers. What about nieces or nephews? Maybe your children are grown. We still need to pray for them. Neighbors, friends, children. Very importantly, the children of our church need our prayers. The children of our school and our daycare need our prayers. It's not easy being a parent, and the more people that can help out with prayer, the better. We all like to brag and tell people about our children and how wonderful our kids are. They're just child geniuses. Gracious and I have a niece. Every star her daughter gets, she puts it on Facebook. Every award, every certificate, she's on Facebook telling about all the things that her child does which she's a smart kid, she deserves it, that's a good thing. But more importantly than putting posts on Facebook, we need to send up posts to God every day. And of course, I'm talking about prayer. That's the one thing that's important. You'll never be a perfect parent, but you can be a praying parent. Let me say that again. You'll never be, never will be a perfect parent, but you can be a praying parent. You can start right now, right this minute, making a positive difference in our children's future. It's never too early, and it's never too late. It doesn't matter if your child is a newborn, perfect in every single way, or if they're 30 years old, going through a third divorce because of addiction. At every stage of our lives, our children's needs and will greatly benefit from your prayers. I hear people say the world's so messed up. Why bring children into this world? But the Bible tells us, look at Psalm 127, 3 to 5. Psalm 127, 3 to 5. This tells us, Children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from Him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. 
If you're a praying parent, you won't just, your children won't just endure this miserable world. They can become leaders, even world changers. There's nothing you can do that will have a higher return on investment. Prayer turns ordinary parents into prophets who shape the destinies of their children, grandchildren, and every generation that follows. Our scripture today was Lamentations 2.19, and in it, God commands, Pour out your heart like water before the face of the Lord. Lift your hands to him for the life of your young children. How much clearer that we, can it be that we're to pray with fervency and passion for our young ones and look forward to those prayers being answered? What is prayer? Prayer is much more than just giving a list of desires to God as if he were the big sugar daddy or Santa Claus in the sky. Prayer is acknowledging and experiencing the presence of God and inviting his presence into our lives and our circumstances. It's seeking the presence of God and releasing the power of God, which gives us the means to overcome any problem. Turn with me to Matthew 18, 18. Matthew 18, 18. We'll be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. God gives us authority on earth. When we take that authority, God releases power to us from heaven because it's God's power and not ours. We become the vessels through which his power flows. When we pray, we bring that power to bear upon everything we are praying about and allow the power of God to work through our powerlessness. When we pray, we are humbling ourselves before God and saying, I need your presence and your power, Lord. I can't do this without you. Let us pray now. Father God, I ask you to be with us today in this message. Help me, Lord, to present it in the best way possible. I pray, Lord, we need your presence with us, for we can't do this without you. In Jesus' name, amen. There was a famine in the land. Then once fertile soil had turned to dry dust, blowing in the wind, nothing would grow. The plants, the leaves were dying on the plants. No fruits or no vegetables would grow. There was a famine coming. People were going to die. The generation would die out. And this was the first century BC, the, the generation before Jesus. The last of the Jewish prophets had died off four centuries before. Miracles were a distant memory. God was nowhere to be heard. The leaders in Jerusalem didn't know what to do. Then someone remembered that there was an eccentric man that lived outside the gates of Jerusalem, and his name was Honai. And Honai was a man of God who believed that God still listened to his prayers. And most importantly, Honai was known to have the power to bring about rain. So they called for Honai to come into Jerusalem so that he could pray and hopefully end this famine that they were having in the drought. So Honai came, he was carrying a six foot staff in his hand. And when he came into the center of town, the people congregated around him. And he stood right in the center of town and he took his staff and he drew a circle completely around himself. He was in the center with a circle drawn with his six foot staff in it. Then he knelt to his knees and he prayed and he had the authority like Elijah when Elijah called down fire from heaven, he called down rain. He said, Lord of the universe, I swear upon your great name that I will not move from this circle until you have shown mercy upon your children. The people who were watching shuddered because he had such authority and such power in what he was saying. His prayer didn't come from his vocal cords. His prayer came from the depths of his soul. He was confident. He was expectant. Then it happened. Raindrops fell upon the people. The people gasped. They were so excited. They saw the rain, he, the answer to the prayer. But it wasn't very much rain. It was a little bit of rain. Honai was not satisfied with a sprinkle. So he didn't get up. He still was kneeling. And he lifted his voice over the people celebrating at those drops of rain. And he said, Not for such rain have I prayed, but for the rain that will fill cisterns, pits, and caverns. The sprinkle turned into a torrential downpour. Too much rain, rain that runs off and doesn't see, seek into, seep into the soil. But the people were getting drenched. They were afraid of the flood, so they fled, and they left Honai. Honai stayed there in his circle. And again, he prayed. He added to his bold request, 
Not for such rain have I prayed, but for rain of thy favor, blessing, and graciousness. Then it began to rain calmly, peacefully. Each raindrop was a token of God's grace. And they didn't just soak the sin, skin, they soaked the spirit with faith. It would be forever remembered as the day, the day thunderclaps applauded the Almighty, the day the legend of the circle maker was born. It had been difficult to believe the day before that such a miracle could happen, but the day after, everyone believed. Honai was celebrated like a hometown hero by the people whose lives he had saved. But some in the Sanhedrin called the circle maker into question. Some of them believed that drawing a circle and demanding rain from God was sacrilegious. These were probably the same people who criticized Jesus for healing a man's withered hand on the Sabbath a generation later. They threatened Honai with excommunication, but because the miracle could not be repudiated, the drought was over, Honai was ultimately honored for his act of prayerful bravado. The prayer that saved a generation was deemed one of the most significant prayers in the history of Israel. The circle he drew in the sand became a sacred symbol, and the legend of Honai the circle maker stands forever as a testament to the power of a single prayer to change the course of history. God is still looking for circle makers. The timeless truth of the ancient legend is as true now as it was then. Bold prayers honor God, and God honors bold prayers. There's nothing God loves more than keeping promises, answering prayers, transforming miracles, and fulfilling dreams. That's who he is, that's what he does. And the bigger the circle we draw, the better, because God gets more glory. Now I want to share with you the nuts and the bolts of praying circles around our children. There are five circles. The first circle is circling the promises of God. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. One of your chief responsibilities as a parent is to be a student of your child. Think about it. You know your child better than they know themselves. Now some of the older kids might say, that's not true. But do they remember when they were born? You do. Do they remember their first steps? You do. You remember everything like it was yesterday. Some of you may have been yesterday. Some of us, it's been a while. A friend whose son is in college said that when, he, when his son was in the third grade, he declared that he knew enough to go out and get a job. He said school had nothing left for him. Fortunately, father knew best. It's your job as a parent, as a friend, to help your children connect the dots between who they were, who they are, and who they will be. Our son Sam was studying pharmacy in college, and he was also working part-time at Friendship. He went on a couple mission trips to the orphanage in Honduras. When he would come home and he would talk about the kids at Friendship, he just glowed. It was an inner light when it meant to him. When he came home and talked about microbiology, it was an interesting subject to him, but there was no glowing there. It was matter of fact. So I prayed for God to show Sam his true calling. And then one day he made the decision to go to, into education instead of pre-pharmacy. And he did this because of his time at Friendship, working with the kids there, and because of his time on the mission trips. And when he made that decision, we both just had a feeling of rightness, that that was the way it should be. And God shown us since then that that was true. In his last year of education, he worked, uh, he did a couple internships, and he just loved it at a school in Prince George's County. Everything went well for him. When it was time for him to graduate and get a job, we were worried because the job market is bad. They took a group of the students over to the union and met with schools that were hiring, and shortly thereafter, he had some interviews, he got the call, he met the board, he got the job, and as many of you know, He's working over in Dover now in his first year as a teacher. And God, we trusted in God's promises, and he gave us the answers to his promise. Our most powerful prayers for our children are hyperlinked to the promises of God. One of my favorite promises is found in Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. 
Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. When we encircle the promises of God, those promises then encircle us. I like the picture on the front of the bulletin that Karen found. It shows a child's hands encircled by a parent's hands. And it tells the whole story, tells the whole sermon of how God encircles us with prayer. You need to circle in your Bible Psalm 37, verse 4. And some of you may know this offhand. Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. This promise doesn't mean he's going to give you whatever you want. It means that you genuinely delight yourself in the Lord. Then the Holy Spirit will radically change your desires. God isn't promising to give you things that aren't good for you. He promises to change your heart so you will want the same things that he wants for you. When Sam and Abby and some of the other kids went on a, their first mission trip to Honduras, I was really nervous about them going overseas to another country, to kind of primitive conditions, and I was praying for them to be kept safe. Then I read an article about mission trips, and it says that you need to pray for your children, young people who are going on a mission trip, to be bold and courageous. It said that safe is for staying home. Bold and courageous is for going out of their comfort zone, changing people, including themselves. When I read this, I thought, oh my, we're telling teenagers to going off to be bold and courageous? Are they crazy? But I modified my prayers and I prayed, started praying more for the leaders of the trip to keep our kids safe. And when they went on their second trip, I didn't know till they came back how important that prayer was. They went into the town of Santa Barbara one evening and Pastor Steve, who was the trip leader, who's now the youth pastor at Spencerville, had a feeling when they were in the town. He saw people, mostly men, congregating, looking at them, and he just felt uncomfortable. It was nothing definite, just an uncomfortable feeling. And all of a sudden, he said, let's go. And he got everybody on the bus, they went back to the orphanage, and later on, all the kids said that they felt something too, uncomfortable, and they were glad to be back. So I didn't know praying for the leaders. This is something we need to keep in mind when our kids go on their mission trip. They're going to be going where there's extreme poverty in South Dakota on the reservation. There's a lot of unemployment and alcoholism is rampant. And we need to pray for our kids who are going to be bold and courageous to share God's message with the people, with the children, with the parents, and for our leaders to keep them safe while they're there and while they're traveling. Our second circle is making prayer lists. Psalm 5, 3 says, Listen to my voice in the morning, Lord. Each morning I bring my request to you and wait expectantly. When I go to the grocery store, I usually make a list. And I make the list according to where things are located in the grocery store. So as I go around, I only have to go around once, hopefully not forget anything, and get the things on my list, some other things too. But when I come out, I've bought what I wanted. But sometimes I like, oh, I only need one or two things. So I'm not going to make a list. I can't possibly forget those two things. So you know the story. You go through the store. $50 later, you come out with a couple bags. You come home. You unpack your bags. And you're missing either one or both of the things that you went there to buy. If we need a grocery list, an invitation list, a to-do list, isn't it possible we need a prayer list? Your prayer list will include things that every parent prays for their child, but you can also personalize your list to their passions and their interests and their personality. You could be praying for everything from safety on the football field, good grades, good friends, and eventually a good career and a good spouse. It's not enough to pray for the concerns of only the moment. We need to pray for the future and we need to pray against the effects of whatever has happened in the past. When King David was depressed over what had happened in his life and fearful about future consequences in Psalm 143, he didn't say, oh well, what will be will be. He cried out to God about the past, present and future of his life. He prayed about everything and that's exactly what we must do. One way to document these prayers is to keep a prayer journal. I read about someone whose father kept a prayer journal for her and her two siblings. 
they didn't even know about it until he passed away and they found the journal and they were able to look back and see when they were two years old what their father was praying for them when they were 12 what were his prayers when they were 20 what were his prayers for them it was something became something that was very valuable to them our third prayer circle for our children is creating prayer mantras when you pray don't babble on and on as people of other religions do matthew 6 7. i am guilty when i leave voicemail voice messages of babbling on and on instead of getting right to the point saying it it's all around and it ends up being this long message and i apologize if i've done it to you and sometimes i feel like prayers are like that babbling babbling on and on mark batterson wrote a series of books about these prayer circles and he said one of the most commonly quoted verses in his family is your focus determines your reality does anyone recognize that quote your focus determines your reality does anyone under 25 recognize it it's not from the bible it's what and i'm not sure how to pronounce this but i'm going to do the best i can kui gan jin says to anakin skywalker in star wars episode one the phantom menace whenever one of his family members is in a funk they pull out this mantra and try to refocus on whatever is true noble right and pure which is from the bible in philippians 4 8. another of his mantras is a deep thought from jack handy if you ever drop your keys into a river of molten lava let them go man because they're gone they don't even have to quote the whole thing it's just if you ever drop your keys and it's enough to remind them to let go and let god i'm going to remind you of a song and you're going to be humming it all afternoon and be mad at me for this but there was a song francesca battistelli i lost my keys we use that we lo lose our keys all the time can't find them looking for them and so we always say i sing it i lost my keys and it's a reminder to let, not get bogged down by stuff not to lose sight of god's plans for us mantras can serve as reminders who we are and what we're about as a family one great prayer mantra that can be repeated through a child's lifetime is luke 2 52. may you grow in wisdom and stature and in favor with god and man our fourth circle is forming prayer circles first timothy 4 12 says don't let anyone look down on you because you are young but set an example for the believers in speech in conduct in love in faith and in purity do you remember i'm sure you do when the people brought their children to jesus and the disciples told them no 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 this is not the time because children weren't valued at that time it was more important that he talked to the adults but jesus said let the children come to me and do not forbid them for of such is the kingdom of god assuredly i say to you whoever does not receive the kingdom of god as a little child will by no means enter it and then the best part he took them up in his arms laid his hands on them and blessed them jesus just didn't didn't just pronounce a blessing over them he put his hands on their heads research shows that touch has a power to fight viruses relieve stress improve sleep and help us recover more quickly from injury i love it that we do that in this church we practice the laying on of the hands you may have noticed last week when our teachers were dedicated as as ministers of education the conference officials who were here laid hands on them as they prayed for them we need to begin to pray in the biblical faction and start with our children great parent does great parenting doesn't mean teaching your kids it also means doesn't mean only teaching your kids it also means learning from them we weren't in the habit when we went to restaurants of praying out loud we prayed silently tried to you know, not let anybody see it one time talk about sam again he went to outdoor school in mount etna which he just went to last week as a teacher but this time he was in the fifth grade and when he came home we went out somewhere and he said can we pray before we eat and he was normally shy and he prayed for us and we've continued it ever since we learned from him so he was bold enough to do it we continue to do it and there's something uniquely powerful about children's prayers working in adventures you hear what's on the hearts of our children throughout each age after our children's story when sarah's here and she prays 
She has the gift of prayer. She understands the story, makes it personal, picks out the lesson, and just has such a powerful prayer about the story. One of the greatest responsibility of parenthood is praying for your kids, but an even greater responsibility is teaching them to pray. In our homes, praying for your kids is like taking them for a ride. Praying with your kids is like teaching them to drive, which is a good thing, but a scary thing. You remember the story of Aaron and her holding up the arms of Moses during the battle when Moses had lost his strength. When he lowered his arms, the Israelite army lost ground. But as long as Aaron and her lifted up his arms, the army was victorious. All of us need Aaron's and hers in our lives. We need people who are strong when we are weak. We need people who are full of faith when we're running on empty. We need people who will fight for us on their knees. We all need a prayer circle. The fifth and last prayer circle is praying through the Bible. Isaiah 55, 10 through 11. If you want to turn to this one, it's a kind of a long one. Isaiah 55, 10 through 11. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. God's word is living and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. It comes from Hebrews 4.12 and it pierces everything it touches. God says his word shall not to return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it will prosper in the thing for which I sent it. If we watch him, walk with him, wait on him, worship him, and live in his word, we will win the battle of our children. Whenever you pray for your children, do it as though you were interceding for his or her life, because that's exactly what you're doing. Satan's plan is to destroy our children. He would try to use any means possible to gain access to them. Drugs, sex, alcohol, rebellion, accidents, disease. Satan will always try to make a case against our children so he can act, have access into their lives. If we're armed with scripture, however, he will have to contend with the word of God. Jesus' death on the cross broke the back of the accuser, but the evil one will still harass all who know who don't know their God-given authority over him. This is where our prayers come in. Our children will withstand accused until we break the stronghold of the accuser in prayer, using the word of God as hard evidence against him. My mother-in-law, Grace, had a Bible that she read morning, night, many times in between. It was written in Marathi. To look at it, it was, looked like just a bunch of symbols. I couldn't read one word of it. But when I saw it in her hands, I knew how, how important it was to her that it was the word of God. When she passed away, her young, gracious youngest sister, Asha, took the Bible and keeps it as her most treasured possession. The Bible is a remind, the Bible itself was nothing special, was nothing magical. What was miraculous about it was the word and the meaning of it. She used those scriptures to pray for her family, for her seven children, and more grandchildren and great-grandchildren than I can count, in two continents. And every single one of them knows how important that Bible was to her. And they know how she prayed for them and the importance of scripture was to her. I read of a man who prayed through an entire Bible with each of his children in mind, starting with the oldest one, Timothy. He circled and underlined phrases that he thought were important for Timothy. He wrote notes in the margins. He literally prayed every promise for his children. A few weeks before Timothy was to graduate from high school, his father planned a special party for Timothy, and many friends brought nice gifts for Timothy. And Timothy's father gave him this Bible and told him, my greatest joy is knowing I have prayed every word of God, every promise of God with my son in mind. He says it was one of the few times in his sobbing uncontrollably. Matthew 20, 29 to 34, tells the story of Jesus and his disciples on their way out of Jer Jericho when two blind men hailed him as they would a taxi. Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. The disciples see this as an interruption, but God saw it as a divine appointment. 
he stops and asks them, what do you want me to do for you? Seriously? Is that question even necessary? They're blind. But Jesus wanted them to tell him what they wanted. He wanted them to spell it out. He wanted to make sure that they knew exactly what they wanted. What if Jesus asked you the same question? What do you want me to do for you? Would you be able to spell out the promises, miracles, and dreams God has put on your heart? I'm afraid many of us would be dumbfounded, caught unaware. We have no idea what we want God to do for us. And the great irony, of course, is that if we can't answer this question, then we're as blind spiritually as those blind men were physically. Like the two blind men outside Jerusalem, we need an encounter with the Son of God. We need answers to the question he is still asking, what do you want me to do for you? Obviously, the answers change over the course of time. We need different miracles at different times of our children's lives. It's a moving target, but you have to start sometime. If you haven't started, start right here and right now. Don't just read the Bible, start circling the promises. Don't just make a wish, write down life goals for you and for your children. Don't just pray, keep a prayer journal. Define your dreams, claim your promise, spell your miracle. Begin a new way to pray today. Think of someone in your life. As I mentioned before, your children, nieces, nephews, neighbors, one of the children in our congregation, one of the children at our school, at our daycare. If you need help with names, any of our teachers, you can ask Ms. Rhonda, she can tell you some people who might need prayer, some children, families. You can ask Michelle, Elmira, Mary Springer. They can give you names of children who come onto our property five to six days a week. How can we let them enter our property, our church, our school, our daycare, and miss the opportunity to shape their life, to intercede on their behalf, to be a prayer warrior for them? Our teachers and our staff are doing this every day. But we, the members of the church, aren't doing it also. We're missing out on a golden opportunity to further God's cause. I was impressed by one of the young people at the school at a couple of recent events, and I've decided to pray for him. And I hope that you will join me in finding someone, whether it's one of our kids in our church or the kids in our school, to pray for systematically and regularly. When it comes to our kids, we desperately need to know the difference between praying for and praying through. Sometimes praying for something is fine. It'll get the job done. But there are often situations, especially when it comes to our kids, when you need to grab hold of the altars, the horns of the altar, and refuse to let go until God answers. Like Honai, you refuse to move from the circle until God answers your prayer. We know that there are three answers to prayer. Yes, no, and wait. But praying through doesn't take no for an answer. And our children's lives don't ever have to be left to chance. Circle makers know that it's always too soon to quit praying because you never know when a prayer, you're a prayer away from a miracle. Possibly the hardest part of praying for our children is waiting for our prayers to be answered. Sometimes the answers come quickly, but many times they do not. Sometimes, in spite of all we've done and all our prayers for them, our children make poor choices and then reap the consequences. Those times are hard for a parent to watch, no matter how old the child. If your child made poor choices, don't berate yourself and stop praying. Instead of giving up, resolve to be even more committed to prayer. Pray with other believers. Stand strong and say, I've only begun to fight, keeping in mind that our part of the fight is to pray. God actually fights the battle. Remember, too, that your fight is not with your child, it's with the devil. He's the enemy. Stand strong in prayer until you see a breakthrough in your child's life. One of the most encouraging scriptures regarding perseverance is when David said, I have pursued my enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn back again till they were destroyed. I have wounded them so that they were not able to rise. They have fallen under my feet. Foe, you have armed me with the strength for the battle. He didn't stop until the job was done, and neither should we. Just remember the legend of the circle maker and the power of a single prayer. One prayer can change everything. Prayer is a very personal one in the first person. So I invite you as I recite this prayer to, in your own minds, also make it personal to yourselves. Lord, I submit myself to you. I realize that parenting a child in the way you would have me to 
is beyond my human abilities. I know you need, I need your help. I want to partner with you and partake of your gifts of wisdom, discernment, revelation, and guidance. I also need your strength and patience, along with a generous portion of your love flowing through me. Teach me how to the, love the way you love, where I need to be healed, delivered, changed, matured, or made whole. I invite you to do that in me. Help me to walk in righteousness and integrity before you. Teach me your ways. Enable me to obey your commandments and do only what is pleasing in your sight. May the beauty of your spirit be so evident in me that I will be a godly role model. Give me the communication, teaching, and nurturing skills that I must have. Make me the parent you want me to be and teach me how to pray and truly intercede for the life of the children in my life. Lord, you said in your word, whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. In Jesus' name, I ask to increase my faith to believe for all the things you put in my heart to pray for concerning these, my children. Amen. Amen.